it's mountain painting time. Got a few mountains here I gotta paint. Get those in the background, get them laid out. Anyway, I've been thinking about a few things and I'm not exactly certain I'm not exactly certain how to relay the information to it because it's esoteric by nature and the topic is relating to symbols like identifying with symbolism in your own body and what you know what can be meant by identifying with a symbol it, it's like listening to the idea of chakra systems that you have seven chakras there 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 it's a uh, it's it's this placement of a symbol like the chakra systems you can look at it like a post with seven lights on it that enters into your body and and then for a meditation sake what I like to do is I like to think of a pentagram entering into the body um, kind of like it's the same thing with the crucifix the laying a symbol over one's body is kind of absorbing the symbol into your thoughts your considerations it's uh, it's it's a way to meditate on things to bring a symbol closer to oneself in a visceral sense and then parlay it, parlay it mentally outward while sensing the movement of the symbol inwardly. It's, it's like a meditation, a yogic meditation. And what's it good for? Well, after I finish the pentagram, then I move, I add another time to the star until I have a hexagram. And that brings uh, an upside down pyramid here and an upside up pyramid here and I push the pyramids together but I do it internally I do it throughout my body and and it's it's another meditative practice and it's 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 kind of a prayerful a prayerful meditation in that the hopes of doing it are are to bring about a sensation relative to patternings in the world but to sense the patterning in yourself that's what that's what that's how I look at it it, it, I, it almost seems instrumental to contact you know if you believe in in soulful entities it seems like a positioning to bond with something that is not rationally present and uh, that's where that's where it's like okay how do I communicate this to a rational speaking audience I mean I just got done watching uh, Reverend Don's vlog on basic lessons in witchcraft and I was going over again Aleister Crowley yesterday and just thinking about what it means to have sacrament, what it means to have an altar, what it means to prayer, what it means to move things, what it means to think in a certain ordered patterning using your throat, using your tongue, using your palate. It's as if you're casting out ideas to the world and the world's re-relating to these ideas. And and there's it, it, it's it's like the most base simplicity, and yet it's also a recognition of what needs to be controlled in the individual, uh, a sense of control in the individual, so that they know what it is that they're putting forth in terms of general patternings of energy. If you look at your own linguistics in in your patterns, you might analyze the energy that you're putting out. I mean, take for instance, thou art that compared to amendum. And 
the energy level, thou art that presence himself at a, a, a pretty arm's length distance, and it's normally a three quarters view, and he's staring upward and outward, and then he peeks at the camera and then moves back and forth that way, where Gary flips the camera on himself, rambles directly into it, turns the camera back to the other the screen, and, and then back and forth, but Gary's tongue lashes out at a higher speed. His vocal cords are higher, and everybody's got a different patterning, and so you sense the energy levels that they're putting out to get an idea of what the form, uh, what the form is. But by form, what am, what am I looking for here? If anybody has any idea, if they can just expound on the idea here, that would be great. Oh, okay, well that's six minutes of ramble. Let me see, somebody posted a comment on my last video, I think it was Carla or Objectia, Objecta99, asking, What are some of the misleading ways, wait, what are the benefits and disadvantages of abstraction? General benefits of abstraction. Well, this is kind of an esoteric topic. It's the benefits of abstraction are that you, you overinflate rationality, you overinflate logic, you overinflate the explicit you overinflate the common regular you move into uh, what it is representations of imaginations representations of of things that are regularly not able to be described in rational discourse uh, the benefits of abstraction is that it re-echoes back in in color fields that go beyond regular considerations of how color should be laid upon an idea so its energy level is different with abstraction uh, especially in painting uh, poetry brings about it kind of guts the inside of an idea and it leads the guts of the idea outwardly even if it's even if the idea is very, very sentimental and it's not grotesque at all, the metaphor of pulling the guts of it out still seems to apply to me. That the guts of uh, an idea come about when you, when you abstract it. I mean, I feel like I've abstracted the clouds here and I've made them, somebody said it looks like a pomegranate or it looks like cotton balls, or it looks like brains, or it looks like it's overcolored, it's too purple, I'm abstracting the clouds. And the benefit is, is that it brings about uh, a whole new idea about how uh, one can consider clouds that goes against the the, the way in which uh, like a video game programmer will hit a button that says part particles and, and then hit uh, another button on how many particles are exuded and then what the particles are and they're little white dots that make up clouds. You know, they're cloud particles. So this goes, this expression goes beyond what you know, it's a hand-painted expression, it's an abstraction, so it's to pull viscerally from your intuition and move you into a whole different state that, that invites you to understand the other individual, the person that's putting forth the idea. And this brings up an idea that Beardy Old Man, the modern mystic, was putting forth. He's like, there is no altruism. It's kind of like listening to Gary say, there is no such thing as random. And I get tired of these people that are trying to use a word, knowing what it means, and saying that it doesn't have meaning, 
or it doesn't have real meaning when the meaning is found in 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 part in parcel in how it's used it's not you know and and the use of a word you know it's not the case for all words that use is important but when you talk about altruism altruism is well, I'm getting I'm getting off topic here, but I might as, I might as well continue to get off topic. Um, whether or not I intend, like like Beardy Old Man was saying, you can, you know, I'm making a video, but I'm doing it for me. I'm not doing it for you. And this kind of overlooks the law of the objective middle, even though damn the law of the objective middle. You know, damn that law because everything will come down to the individual. And I thought, okay, is selfishness or altruism? Is altruism a type of selfishness or is selfishness a type of altruism? And ultimately I say that, that altruism is a type of selfishness. And so I'm in agreement with what he's saying in a particular deconstructive format of trying to monize the binary between, between altruism and, and selfishness. Like, he, th there's a sensibility to arguing that everything is selfish, but when you look at the word altruism, you know, it's kind of like saying, is left a type of right or is right a type of left? And I would say that right is a type of left, but where, where's my argument there? Where is, how do you deconstruct a patterning? Like, is east a type of west or west a type of east, right? It's difficult to deconstruct these, and then you're, you're moving into a whole different form of abstraction when you're trying to deconstruct that. So if you take altruism and selfishness, and you boil it down and you say, okay, altruism is a type of selfishness, then, then you have a concurrence with the idea that everything I do is all about me, but I'm putting stuff in the public domain. Language is public. It's not private. And so I'm objectifying it when I put it out there, and I know that I'm putting it out there. I'm aware of that. And by putting it out there, other people can acquire benefit uh, it's kind of like conference report talking about capital benefit or uh, the capital of what we do on YouTube has a particular role in it, you know, has a particular role. And that capital is, is, um, is brought about when you display things in public. There's, there's things that other people get from your videos, and if they get anything from your video, regardless of your intent, regardless of your intent, you have done something altruistic. You've gifted the altruism. The altruism is taken. And, and this is a difference between, you know, the phrase, are you picking up what I'm laying down? Are you picking up what I'm laying down? Because what I'm laying down might be completely selfish, but I'm putting it in the public domain. And if you're picking it up, however, whatever style, whatever form, whatever visceral sense in which you're picking up what I'm laying down, you might get a benefit from it. And hence, what it is I've done is something altruistic, regardless of my intent. And so there's the regardless of my intent usage of altruism that makes it a real word, you know. And, and part of me, knowing that people can get a benefit from it, knowing the fact that I've just said, can leave an intent with the word. And that intent, you know, can once again be beneficial. And that benefit is, is that it's, you know, it's got meaning. There's, there's meaning in all words, you know. You have to have a reader and a speaker, but as soon as you understand the word, there's a place for it. And provided that there's a place for the word, provided that there's, that there's a meaning, that the, the word has been used, then it takes on a meaning.
And so what I was trying to do initially in the video was talk about a visceral sense of a symbol that is based in your epistemy. You have an epistemy about the shape of a symbol, and then you try to move it into a visceral sensation or meditation, a form of self that takes on a geometry, uh, a geometry of self. And that there's a benefit, a practical benefit of putting oneself in different geometric meditations, the cross over the body, the prayer modes, the speaking modes. Okay, and then I wanted to speak a little bit about the absurdity, moving into absurdity, and why one would want to move into absurdity. Because if you move into absurdity, then you're moving into the abstract. If you move into the abstract, then you can, your, your freedom opens up. You're released from the bondage of reason and contradiction and objective middles. You can say what you want. You can, Beardy Man can say all that he wants, you know. I can argue with it, but his point is nevertheless still placed out there in the world as a bubble of an idea that I, my bubble, my, whatever my form is in all of its complexity, in its cloud form, meshes and overlays and intuits and envelopes his idea and then it comes out of it and then I can brouhaha logic at a whim or I can uh, you know make incarnate rationality and make certain I'm within the confines of rationality but I'm more robust I'm bigger than these forms and so it allows a freedom of movement. It's kind of like my mountains. My mountains are, I'm confined to the shape of the mountain. I'm trying to do something representational with the mountain in terms of putting snow on its peaks and dirt on the ground. And so I'm limited to the representational aspect as long, you know, as far as I want to limit myself. I can totally wipe one of these out. I can make the mountain upside down if I wanted. I could color it pink. I can do whatever I want, so I'm free to abide, or I'm free to, to abstract. Anyway, let me see what that other question was. I'm going on and on. I've got a date with destiny today. Let's see. Uh, what are some misleading ways to think of abstraction? What are some misleading ways to think of abstraction? Huh. Well, a, mis a misleading way to think of abstraction is when you're trying to stay within the confines of secular logic. You're trying to stay within the confines like your public, whoever is picking up the words you're laying down, is relying on a logical discourse from you. And you might want to use a metaphor, which is a type of abstraction, but you might your metaphor might not be appropriate. You might mislead people in that abstraction, provided that they're trying to retain rational structures of thinking. And so that's how I would think you could mislead, but how else might one mislead into abstraction? It's kind of like if I'm trying to retain a representationalism, but, but the representation is already abstracted, like it's a different color, like my mountains do not really look like mountains. You know, it's still kind of candy-coated, cartoony-looking structures, and so if I mislead an abstraction, they're, since they're already abstract, I might mislead the abstraction by painting them pink and turning one upside down. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> That's, it's a great question. How does one mislead misleading ways? What are some misleading ways to think about abstraction? Like, okay, the whole idea of reducing the language that, that Gary 
uh, and Beardy Man and some of these determinists are trying to put forth um, their their ideas. Uh, they they are are trying to reduce um, considerations, words, the possibility of words. They're trying to limit that. And that's a form of abstracting the language, I think, that is misleading. Um, anyway, in what ways were 20th century thinkers influenced by the prospects of reducing language? <laughs> okay, oddly enough, the question's kind of right up the alley. In what ways were the 20th century thinkers influenced by prospects of reducing language, mathematics, and thought to logic? Well, the logical positivist, Wittgenstein, was reducing everything to complete epistemological diamond, uh, a, a geometric logical form that was described in like that everything could be described in terms of logic, in terms of facts of the world. Everything is reduced to facts, not things. Kind of zombie picture shows obsession with the Tractatus. And so there's this, there's this crystalline logical structure that everything was reduced to. And then Wittgenstein, you know, somebody who said, what is the meaning of this rubbing their chin up? kind of flicking it forward almost, I'm assuming it was like that, you know, I'm abstracting the idea, but they made a gesture that has a meaning that is not found within logical considerations or facts. Therefore, the metaphor took on meaning that went outside of the crystalline logical structure. So the reduction, trying to say that has no meaning, let's get it out of the language because it has no meaning, let's form fit in a logical search. Wittgenstein eventually realized that language is more organic, it's more ontological, and he moved into, into a more robust sense uh, of language. Hello? Hey, are you here? Well, I can either come down or if you guys want to come up and shave off the back half of my mohawk, that'd be cool. <laughs> I, I could go for that, but uh, um, maybe we could do that when you drop, drop me off. Well, if you guys want to park and come on up, that'd be fine. Um, Okay, I'll see you in a second. Cool. Bye. I'm getting the back half of my mohawk cut off because I think it looks shitty in the back. You know, what do I do about the front? What do I do? I'm so vain sometimes. Just the way I look, the way I feel, and how I sense things. I feel like a skedaddle, a skedaddle day. Um... 20th century inventors influenced by the prospects of reducing language, mathematics, and thought to logic. Anyway, that was that's that's my, you know, if you study the logical positivists, if you study Wittgenstein, which I don't think Gary has studied any of of Wittgenstein to see the transition from language, how it is he was trying to make language completely logical and then ultimately failed and found so many other language games that are going on that went well beyond and outlined, um, enveloped the logic. And ultimately, you know, the ontology is argued to be primacy that, that, um, ow. I don't know. I don't know where I wanted to go from there. Anyway, I've got company, so it's been a pleasure. Please leave a comment below if you disagree or however you think about it. Howdy.